The Majority Report with Sam Cedar. The destiny of America is always safer in the hands of the people than in the conference rooms of any elite. Sam Cedar. They are unanimous in their hate for me, and I welcome their hatred. We must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. The Majority Report with Sam Cedar. <laughs> And I get the feeling you've been cheated. It is Friday, November 29th, 2019. My name is Sam Cedar. This is the five-time award-winning Majority Report. We are broadcasting live to tape. Steps from the industrially ravaged Gowanus Canal in the heartland of America. Downtown Brooklyn, USA. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, on the program today, the Society of Black Alumni Presidential Professor and Professor of History at Johns Hopkins University, Martha S. Jones, and her book, Birthright Citizens, A History of Race and Rights in Antebellum America. Ladies and gentlemen, to celebrate Thanksgiving, I hope you had a happy one. We have uh, taken today off, but uh, had this great uh, interview with uh, Martha S. Jones. Uh, Regular listeners will know that I have, um, I'm developing quite a thing for a reconstruction. This is the period following the Civil War in this country. It's when the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments to the Constitution were passed. And in many respects, the America that we live in today, that era was really the founding era of the America that we live in today. And uh, it was a time, it's a fascinating time, and and we're going to try and do more on Reconstruction, um, you know, just to break up the sheer horror of the era that we're living in. Um, But it's also very instructive. Not to mention that's when the um, one of the three impeachments that we've had in this country took place. Andrew Johnson was impeached. He was not convicted in the Senate. I think they missed it by one vote. We spoke to to Alex Perrine about that the other day. The radical Republicans at the time, they started things like public school and um, many other uh, inventions, as it were. Uh, It also was an era that led into a Supreme Court that was incredibly conservative, that allowed for suppression of voting rights, that um, created an era that basically shut the door to a lot of progressive um, uh, changes in this country. So a fascinating era. And uh, this is a fascinating look at the concept of birthright citizenship, which obviously is uh, big in play and conservatives are going after. So uh, it's an interesting talk, I think. I certainly enjoyed it. And um, we will be back live on uh, Monday. Just a reminder, you can support this show by going to jointhemajorityreport.com. When you do, you get the show commercial free and you get extra content on every other day except for today. Uh, today we're just doing this, um, because, you know, want to, to be there, uh, for you, but, uh, a lot of people don't, you know, a lot of people out of their regular flow of things, but you can, uh, listen to this and, uh, listen to, uh, uh, Wednesday's show. Uh, we will be back live on Monday. We've got, um, more impeachment hearings next week, but, uh, not fact witnesses, so I don't know how much of that we will carry at least live. We will probably cover it, um, uh, you know, after the fact. We've got uh, debates coming up over the next month or so. Congress is going to return. Uh, there's a uh, continuing uh, resolution. And uh, we may see a government shutdown. Unlikely, though, because the Democrats bungled this as far as, far as I'm concerned. But all this and more. So um, buckle up the next 12 months are going to be uh, nuts. And then perhaps maybe the months after that as well. Take a quick break. Be right back with Martha S. Jones.
on Birthright Citizens. We are back. Sam Cedar on the Majority Report on the phone. It is a pleasure to welcome to the program Professor Martha S. Jones. She is the Society of Black Alumni Presidential Professor and Professor of History at the Johns Hopkins University and author of Birthright Citizens, A History of Race and Rights in Antebellum America. Welcome to the program, Martha. Thanks for having me. So um, the... I, I don't know if um, if this constitutes a, a myth, but I think certainly my belief, let's put it that way, um, was that the idea of birthright citizenship um, almost like completely fully formed in uh, post-war, uh, post-Civil War era, the, in the Reconstruction era, and as a function of the, the three amendments that were uh, sort of the hallmark of the Reconstruction era, your work um, basically outlines the 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 presence of this idea, I guess, or the germination of this idea in the pre Civil War era. Um, you looked at Baltimore. Why why Baltimore? Before the Civil War, Baltimore is home to the largest community of free African Americans, former slaves, um, in the United States. Um, It sits at a geographic and political crossroads. It is, by and large, a free city in a slaveholding state. Um, And it is home to some of the most notorious of the the pre-war era's uh, legal elite, including Roger Brooke Tawney, who um, some of your listeners may know his name because he authors uh, the Dred Scott decision in 1857 that says no black person can be a citizen of the United States. So all of those things come together uh, to let us uh, explore a story about the origins of this idea of birthright citizenship in a community that is actively struggling around um, whether they belong and by what terms they might belong in the United States as well as in Baltimore. And and it's that 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 tension of um, freed black slaves in a um, uh, a slave state that um, basically folks develop. Um, I guess, responses to uh, Dred Scott. Um, I mean, so why don't we discuss maybe some of those responses? You look at some specific individuals um, and how their their stories, I guess, tell the story of the development of, of, of birthright uh, citizenship. Um, George Horton. Uh, tell us who, who George Horton was. Well, Horton is um, uh, stands in for a really important uh, group of African American men who, after the war, um, after the Revolutionary War, are making their way as free people, um, are relegated to um, some of the most um, brutal and menial labor um, in many American cities, and uh, sign up uh, to be sailors as a way to um, claim some dignity um, around their labor, but also um, to um, broaden um, their perspectives on the world. So Horton is a sailor. Um, He disembarks, um, as sailors do, when his ship comes in uh, to port. And um, walking on the streets of of Washington, D.C., is accosted by... Um, uh, what is typical in Washington, um, folks who are looking to um, make a dollar, perhaps, um, uh, on the fines that might be imposed on someone who was um, captured as a fugitive. Um, And he uh, ignites a a debate, um, both within um, the courts of Washington, um, but within Uh, the political newspapers of the period, and in his home state of New York, because it turns out that while on the streets of Washington, he's an unknown figure, 
um, in New York, in upstate New York, um, where he's from, he's a well-known individual. And by the time his story um, is done, um, he's threatened with sale as um, into servitude as a fugitive, um, uh, leading lights of New York's legal culture, in, including the governor of New York State, will intervene, um, thankfully, uh, to um, ensure that he um, gains his liberty. Um, so he stands in for um, really a, an, ex- more, an important community of men who are um, traveling by way of um, the Atlantic, traveling by way of rivers, um, by canals, um, and as they move through space, are being um, accosted, accused, um, treated as non-citizens, um, and the puzzle for them is how to prove that they, in fact, are, and um, in fact, they are people entitled to rights. And, and and just place uh, us. I mean, uh, where where is his story operative relative to uh, Dred Scott? And the Dred Scott uh, decision came down in in 1857, and um, you know, uh, you know, in in many respects, well, I mean, I guess maybe the the wheels are grinding towards war, anyways. But certainly, um, uh, grease those wheels. Uh, but w- where, so where, when we when we talk about um, uh, Horton, like wh- whose experience? I mean, he's representing, you know, sort of a, a broad swath of, of of men's experience at that time. Who, uh, when would that have been, and how much would? Um, would Dred Scott completely foreclose any sort of like, I don't know, legal nooks and crannies or um, uh, toeholds that had been developed? Or um, what, would that still sort of dance around Dred Scott? It's a great question because um, men like Horton are active um, both in terms of their daily lives, but also in courthouses and in legislatures um, well before Dred Scott. Um, pushing on this point of view, this claim that they are citizens of the United States. And it turns out that Dred Scott, though it's a case that we uh, remember um, because it is uh, notorious for its brutal language, um, that Dred Scott is a pretty late volley. Um, By the time we get to 1857, um, African Americans, free African Americans, have been claiming to be citizens of the United States for many decades, at least going back to the 18 teens. And so, Justice Tawney, who decides Dred Scott, is in its essence trying to shut down that debate, right? Shut, trying to shut down that movement, trying to settle the question. And it's an important point you raise: Does Dred Scott then? Um, thwart all that. And it turns out when we look closely at what happens after Dred Scott, the answer is no. Um, that in fact, by the time we get to 1857, the debate around black citizenship is complex enough, um, it is sophisticated enough, it is um, controversial enough um, that African Americans can find judges, um, can find state lawmakers who will affirm them as citizens of the United States, even in the face of Dred Scott. Um, So while Justice Tawney's language in Dred Scott is devastating, um, and yes, it turns up the um, the stakes, if you will, for African Americans um, with respect to the question of citizenship and ultimately the stakes in the Civil War, all of that is true. But my interest is, was really in closer to the ground, the experience of everyday life. And did Dred Scott change everyday life for former slaves? And with some exceptions, the best answer we have is no, it didn't. Hey, okay. So is that, I mean, is that, so when you say, you know, uh, it's, you, you described sort of the, the pursuit of citizenship uh, by by the time we get to Dred Scott as more complicated and more sort of I guess developed. I mean, when we when, when we use those type of of adjectives, are we basically just talking about the, there have been I don't know tens or hundreds of little battles uh, that or questions that um, or maybe thousands um, a, a across the country uh, as it were at that time where individuals will make this decision or will make a decision that has implications because there's no there's no real holding 
right? There's no there's no grand edict as to who's a citizen before Dred Scott. And then and then I should say also it sort of feels like the Dred that part of the Dred Scott decision seems to be more reasoning as opposed to I mean because the Dred Scott was not specifically a case about our our um, um, our 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 black people are, are they eligible to be American citizens? It was more sort of the reasoning as yes. to why um, a a black person could be brought back from one state to another. I mean, it was sort of like a weird assault on states' rights, I guess, on some level, or 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 not. I don't know. It depends on how, which perspective. But but I mean, so so when you talk about the sort of the the law being mature and and, and complicated at that point, it's because. In each little locality, some decision is being made that maybe not explicitly about citizenship indicates citizenship in some way. Yeah, so you're, you're painting um, absolutely the picture um, that I discover in Birthright Citizens, that depending on who you ask and where you are and what the circumstances are, um, you may get one or another answer about whether or not free African-Americans are citizens of the United States. And um, I understand the, um, the, uh, the impulse to treat a Supreme Court decision as somehow having greater force than all of those hundreds or thousands of small decisions. But a, even a Supreme Court decision requires that judges in lower courts, local officials, and African-Americans themselves um, in a sense, respect that decision and abide by its terms. And it turns out in the example of Dred Scott that um, courts, um, lower courts, adjacent courts um, are really um, reluctant and resist the insistence, if you will, that um, Justice Tawney has tried to impose and continue to treat black Americans as citizens of the United States. Now, now I'm going to take you into the weeds for just two seconds to sure. say the issue in Dred Scott is many things, including whether or not the Scots are free or enslaved people. Of course, that is the core of the case. But the reason we get to the citizenship question in Dred Scott is because Scott has brought his case now in federal court and the federal courts um, have authority only to hear a limited range of cases, including cases brought by citizens of the United States. And this means that before the court can get to the merits, right, to the heart of Dred Scott, it has to determine whether or not he actually um, is someone eligible to bring his case before a federal court. Hence, the court goes to this question of citizenship, and it has implications once the court holds that no black person is a citizen of the United States. It is a bar against African Americans using the federal courts, be they enslaved or free. So that's how we get there, is because Scott has um, tried to use the federal courts, um, which are only open to citizens of the United States, um, and the court concludes that he's not a citizen, and hence his case should be dismissed. So that was just a case of standing, and uh, the, the the court found he had no standing, at least, or there was no jurisdiction in the context of, of federal courts. Yeah, and that, yes, and then Justice Tony, um, how can I say, Justice Tony overreaches, right, right, and then goes to the next question, and that's how we get to. Um, then the conclusion um, that no black person can be a citizen of the United States and that Scott himself is a slave. So, uh, and I don't want to get too caught up on this, but when we talk about lower courts being somewhat reluctant to, um, to read this decision as being binding in that specific way, how much of geography played into which courts would and would not. And when we say those lower courts, are we talking in the federal system? Are we talking in the state system? Um, and, and I'm just curious as to how that was dispersed and to what extent that was something that may have, um, you know, fueled ultimately uh, the war. Sure. So um, both state courts and federal courts, lower federal courts are, um, 
charged oftentimes with determining who is a citizen of the United States. And those kinds of cases continue after Dred Scott. And in my research, the only state I could find in which a lower federal court upheld the reasoning in Dred Scott on the question of black citizenship. The only case I could find was one case in the state of Mississippi. And there, um, the court had flip-flopped. Originally, it had rejected the logic of Dred Scott um, and then comes back to adopt it. But it turns out, as best I can determine, um, to be the exception rather than the rule, that when we look across the whole of the U.S., both in state courts, such as Maryland, the state I study, um, or federal courts um, in the Midwest, um, those courts will um, distinguish the circumstances of the black people who come before them from the case of Dred Scott and permit African Americans to use the federal courts as citizens, if you will, despite Dred Scott. So, um, so this is where we're, we're... I mean, this is basically the landscape and the sort of the, I guess, the origins of of um, a birthright citizenship prior to the 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 war, um, and then mm-hmm. um, much of this is basically um, well, ultimately will be rolled in in, in into um, the Fifteenth uh, Amendment um, uh, in, in in Reconstruction. Where were the other sources? I mean, we have these isolated cases and you write about other uh, other men who who bring up other sort of, I guess, uh, issues or, you know, reveal other perspectives. Where else was the the idea of of birthright citizenship growing? And were there any sort of like competing notions of citizenship? It's a great question. Um, So African-Americans are um, using a forum um, that comes to be called the Colored Conventions. This is a a shadow convention movement that parallels political parties and state legislatures. And so we look, for example, at the ways in which black Americans are working through this idea, developing it, um, debating it. um, And they do so in the context of this colored convention movement. Um, We can look at um, state constitutional conventions. Um, Maryland is my example. And in 1850-51, Maryland lawmakers revise their, really rewrite their constitution, and they debate this question. Um, We can look at the floor of Congress, where as early as 1821, when Congress is contemplating admitting Missouri as a new state, um, a question arises um, with respect to how Missouri should regard black Americans who might want to enter into the new state. And Congress um, debates whether or not black people are entitled to the privileges and immunities of the equality of citizenship that would entitle them to enter Missouri. So part of the work in Birthright Citizens is to um, piece together all of these um, varied places in which the question of citizenship is being debated. Now, the thing I would say is that Um, Part of what African-Americans do very early on is they read closely the Constitution of 1787, the original Constitution, to see if there isn't language there, there isn't a suggestion there about who they might be. And they fix on what for a long time was a, a, a rather ignored clause in the Constitution, one that requires the citizen to Uh, the president to be a natural born citizen of the United States. And they say two things, right? First is, well, if the president is a natural born citizen, there must be such a category, right? And the constitution acknowledges it. And secondly, there's no color line in this constitution. And so if the president is a natural born citizen, why aren't we also? And this really is the, um, the, 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 the seed, right, um, that they then germinate for a very long time, um, looking to interpret the original Constitution as providing for birthright um, and advocating that um, and observing that white men and women and children um, are um, unequivocally citizens of the United States when they are born in the United States. And so, again, this category must exist 
Um, the debate really is whether blackness, um, whether racism can function um, in law constitutionally as a bar um, to their claim to belonging. By the time we get to the Civil War era, um, all of this is very quickly up for debate. Uh, by 1862, um, the United States Attorney General Edward Bates will issue an opinion from his office um, that really upturns Dred Scott and says, yes, um, free African Americans are citizens. The Civil Rights Act of 1866. Um, will um, affirm that by its language. And then in 1868, the 14th Amendment will constitutionalize birthright and, if you will, affirm or settle um, the debate that African Americans have been generating for a very long time. Was there um, uh, like an, an organ? Was there was there an organized um, and, and strategic I guess um, a, a, a place or an entity or institutions that were or, or organizing and sort of like plotting this strategically. Um, the the idea that we can, you know, that we have there is this category that exists, natural born citizen, and um, it just so happens that it, that category is relevant if you're going to become president. But if that exists, you know, like you say, if it, if it exists, uh, what what does it take to be that? It doesn't say anything about uh, your color. It just says you need to be born in the United States. Um, right. Uh, is there is there an organization that is pushing the urge uh, that is like um, attempting to push this forward, this concept, or is this just sort of like piecemeal as, um, you know, sort of various other cases come up? Sure. So I've mentioned the colored conventions, which is really um, the most sustained and robust of African-American political organizations before the Civil War. In fact, the conventions will continue even after the war. Um, so there is a place where black Americans are debating this question alongside anti-slavery, alongside education and labor and all of the issues of the day. In addition to that, we have, um, for example, in Baltimore, um, an organization um, late in the 1820s called the Legal Rights Association. And these are local black activists who band together, and their purpose is indeed to try and build a case that they are citizens of the United States. They will um, appeal to and, in fact, try and hire um, some of the best-known legal thinkers on citizenship um, from the period, trying to um, amass um, evidence and opinions that support um, their position. Um, and abolitionists are important allies in this struggle. Um, I write about a man named William Bates, who in the 1830s will publish um, a treatise called The Rights of Colored Men. Um, and and Yates will um, spend many, many pages um, and years of his life um, pulling together these arguments, publishing them in treatise form, um, and circulating them so that they can be used in those many individual instances, but also so that they can inform um, all sorts of deliberative bodies like courts and legislatures and constitutional conventions. Um, so um, this is not a period during which we have yet the emergence of the kind of um, sustained and corporatized civil rights um, apparatus that right. we associate with the early 20th century. But I think, or I hope you can hear in what I'm describing, um, the beginnings of that, um, uh, really modeled in a way that suits the 19th century, uh, but will take a different um, sort of form in the 20th century. And, and we should say it was not, uh, people shouldn't sure. take for granted that abolitionists would would follow that um would be looking to strategize on how uh, blacks could become citizens. There was a, um, you know, I don't, I don't know. You, you would have a better sense than I, but a significant portion of abolitionists who, whose resolution was more like, yeah, no, not citizenship. Just uh, you go somewhere else, <laughs> or uh, well, well, yes. So we, so and those folks we call colonizationists, right? Um, and they organized, um, or I should say, they anticipate the end of slavery. Colonization is. Do. Um, but uh, they also look forward, if you will, 
to maintaining the United States as a white man's country. And so colonization has raised funds and organized, um, outfit ships, established the colony of Liberia in West Africa um, to fulfill a vision in which once slavery ends, former slaves will be removed from the United States and relocated to West Africa. So that is a brand of anti-slavery thought. There are other anti-slavery thinkers like the radical William Lloyd Garrison who reject the Constitution, um, who um, interpret the Constitution um, to be a, a compact with slaveholders and would not look to this language that black activists are looking to as a um, a way to resolve the question of African-American rights. Um, Garrison rejects the Constitution, but many black activists do and increasingly will, um, including figures like Frederick Douglass, increasingly will, as we move into the 1840s and 1850s, look directly to the Constitution for solutions to the problems of slavery and the aspirations to citizenship. I I want to... um... Uh, I, I want to swing back around to uh, Reconstruction and, and sort of, um, you know, maybe maybe on some level, uh, Garrison's perspective was um, was in, at least in some ways um, acquiesced to in, insofar as that there was a need to have a, an explicit amendment. But before we get there, I, I'm just super curious about this part about it. There, there's a there was a, a Supreme Court case about the Second Amendment uh, talking about um, uh whether um, and, 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 and the rights to interstate travel and whatnot, and, and, the, and that there was a, uh, a ruling that um, black people, free black people, um, unlike the, um, you know, unlike white people, could be uh, would have to apply for documents, both I think in the context of the Second Amendment, and I think maybe also for for interstate travel. But I'm I'm most interested in the Second Amendment uh, because I I wonder if the um, there is like some fodder there for people today who are looking for a um, you know some argument about. Uh, requirements regarding, you know, gun ownership, if they couldn't look to that. I mean, obviously, we wouldn't um, want to base it on the fact that some people were black and some people were white. But if the idea that this right could be abridged in some fashion, um, it would be interesting. I'm, am I am I barking up a wrong tree? And if so, we can go and, well, and move to the other tree. <laughs> Here's what I would say, because I think you, I think you're raising something very important. Um, It really isn't until the 20th century um, that um, the Bill of Rights, as we know it today, um, comes to be understood as protecting um, a panoply of individual interests. So um, while there is a Second Amendment um, in the Constitution before the Civil War, it doesn't um, have a jurisprudence that's developed around it. And so people aren't reaching for the Second Amendment when they... um, uh, are looking to keep firearms or um, be licensed to have firearms. But state governments and localities are indeed um, regulating um, the, the ownership and the use of firearms before the Civil War. And Maryland is typical in that um, in regulating firearms, the state draws a clear line between the rights it extends to white citizens and the rights it extends to black citizens at the same time. So African-Americans in a state like Maryland can um, possess and own firearms, but in order to do so, they have to, um, if you will, uh, surmount an additional hurdle. And that hurdle is they must come into a local courthouse, establish their character to the satisfaction of the court, reveal the purpose um, for their um, interest, um, both in owning a gun and in travel, which you also mentioned. Um, And then they receive, um, if the court approves, a license or a permit um, to do so. Um, But even absent the Second Amendment, before the Civil War, there's a question that the uh, possession of a firearm in a city like Baltimore, um, the capacity to carry a firearm openly in a city like Baltimore is one sign of one's political 
standing in the community. Um, and African American men, um, yes, they look to possess guns um, for their own safety and security. Um, they look to have guns in order to hunt and to sustain their families and and their um, and their um, and their communities. Um, and at the same time, um, we know that this capacity to um, carry a gun um, in the 1850s has a symbolic value. It is a sign that one is a full or a fuller member of a body politic um, in a city like Baltimore before the Civil War, where guns are instruments of political culture um, and um, literal weapons of either getting out the vote or suppressing the vote um, in uh, in a decade like the 1850s. And so there's deep meaning associated with guns, even as they don't uh, they don't yet rise to the level of um, a constitutional right in this period. That will really be a question for the 20th century. So um, the uh, so ultimately, when we we look at the um, the I guess it's the the Fifteenth Amendment um, that um, oh, excuse me I'm for the for, uh, the 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 Fourteenth Amendment um, yes uh, I mean we're just looking at a culmination of work that happened prior to the war in many respects right I mean this is not like a, a mm -hmm. new idea that we need to to develop at this point um, what um, when we look, you know, and the idea of, of of birthright citizenship has obviously come up more recently. Um, yeah. um, I, give me your sense of like what was there alternate was there alternate uh, versions, I guess, of like the um, the the you know the 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 fourteenth or the thirteenth uh, amendment that um, that that could have could have been drawn up that would, I don't know, make it more, I, I mean, less susceptible and, and maybe it's not really susceptible to attacks, but we're seeing them attack the idea of it. Um, was, was there a, like an alternate version? Uh, that's a great question. Um, I think where we are now and I certainly am not an insider at the White House um, to be certain what the thinking is there. But if I'm correct, what's going on right now is that there is a rethinking, a push to rethink um, some very, so the somewhat cryptic language in the 14th Amendment that while Generally, persons born in the United States are citizens of the United States. The amendment makes an exception for persons not subject to the jurisdiction of the United States. And even when I say those words, you understand, right, how murky a question right. that might be. Now, we know what Congress intended, but um, we also know um, that... Um, Today, uh, there are um, figures in Washington who, who would like to revisit that clause and to use it uh, to say uh, that the children of undocumented immigrants are not subject to the jurisdiction of the United States and hence are not entitled to claim birthright citizenship. And... So were we to turn back the hands of time, um, we might have asked Congress to be more explicit about who it was referring to and what it was referring to when it inserted this cryptic clause um, such that it would not be subject to reinterpretation, in my view, misinterpretation in the 21st century. It's almost like um, 100. So yes, it's, a, it's almost 180 degrees. Uh, misinterpreted. Like, I mean, it seems to me it, that the actual it, reading it is. of subject to the jurisdiction thereof of the United States 
is expands on the notion of people who are born in the United States. So in other words, if yeah. uh, the United States controls some territory uh, that is not officially the United States, that you are actually eligible for 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 uh, birthright citizenship um, because well, it's, it turns out you're not. It turns out you're not. And that's important to say um, that people who are born in United States territories um, are citizens subject to the terms of Congress, um, not the terms of the 14th Amendment. And so some people are birthright citizens by, act, by virtue of an act of Congress, right? It's a legal fiction, um, even if they are born outside of the United States. But people who live, for example, today are born in American Samoa are not birthright citizens. Um, they are U.S. nationals, and they have rights that flow from that status, um, but they are not, they are deemed by Congress to be not born in the United States. And that's, the, that's where things are turning with respect to this clause in the 14th Amendment. The sub-question is who has the right or the power or the authority to interpret that cryptic clause? Um, the president has told us of late that he thinks he does, and he's going to do that by way of an executive order. Um, others make the argument that it is Congress that has the right to interpret that provision in the 14th Amendment. And still others argue that only the, the, the federal courts, ultimately right. the U.S. Supreme Court, has the authority. And we have not tested that question directly in our history. Um, and that is where I think we are. Um, it is a moment of profound uncertainty for people whose citizenship is being drawn into question um, because um, this question, I think, ultimately will be in the hands of the U.S. Supreme Court should it be formally posed. Um, and I don't think we know what this U.S. Supreme Court would decide. If you are correct. It would be a profound and radical departure from everything we've ever known or believed or practiced um, when it comes to birthright. Um, if one is born in California, one is a citizen of the United States, um, for example. That is the example of Kamala Harris. Um, but I think we don't know yet what this U.S. Supreme Court might do with this question. And for me, then, that requires us to exercise just a bit of caution um, when um, drawing conclusions, because as we know, there are people, our families, our friends, our neighbors, our coworkers' um, lives are on the front line, right. and we don't think can offer an ironclad assurance that we know um, how the Supreme Court will interpret that clause in the 14th Amendment. Well, it's a fascinating... Even, even as we think we know how they should. Right. It's a fascinating question. I mean, you know, they open, if they want to open up that door, one wonders what's the limiting principle, right? Like, I mean, because if yes. your own birth does not guarantee you citizenship in the United States, well, well then why should your parents' uh, birth in the United States guarantee you citizenship? And so on and so on. I mean... If you, you know, you, you, theoretically, you know, there's nothing in there to indicate. And um, if you if you determine that uh, your birth uh, is not um, is not a function of uh, of of your citizenship. Well, you know, at one point we all came over here uh, with the parents of, uh, of immigrants. And um, why should you know what's the limiting principle? But I guess um, we'll I, find you're, you're, you're right. I mean, which is to say we live in a time where, um, you know, the box, the rules, right, our, our norms about citizenship are um, being scrutinized and questioned very deliberately. And I would say we are already there, um, that you don't need to dig um, deep into um, the news coverage of the day. Um, in order to discover that uh, a U.S. citizen, a birthright citizen, has been detained uh, somewhere in the United States, um, that person's documents have been drawn into question, that person has been held um, against their will and against their rights um, until 
days pass, weeks pass, and their citizenship status is um, affirmed, that is already happening um, here in 2019. Um, And my sense is that we are in an era in which the vulnerable, the exceptional um, folks who are whose citizenship has always been fragile because of racism um, are on the front lines of this. Um, And I think you're not wrong to suggest that you don't know where it ends because to undo birthright is to open the door um, to a political and legal regime in which perhaps anyone who is a member of a despised community, and I use that term qualifiedly, right. but you take my point. Anybody, um, be you the child of a um, Communist Party member um, or a Muslim immigrant um, or um, a Mexican immigrant, um, there are many, many communities of unpopular people in this country and despised communities in any given political moment. And I think we are already in an era when that kind of um, thinking is distorting and remaking the principle of of birthright. And um, it won't come uh, immediately, right? The reckoning won't come immediately for um, middle class white Americans born in the United States, um, that's not likely. Um, but I think we're all on notice um, that this um, political era, this administration is um, committed to challenging our fundamental values when it comes to citizenship, including the principle of both birthright. And where that ends, um, I, don't think, I don't think, in fact, we know. The book is Birthright Citizens, A History of Race and Rights in Antebellum America. Uh, Professor Martha S. Jones, thank you so much for your time today. I really appreciate it. We're going to put a link uh, to your book at uh, MajorityReportRadio.com, and we will put it in the uh, podcast and YouTube uh, descriptions. Thanks again. Thanks so much.